Dr. Feldman's research explores the ways in which computational techniques can aid in understanding variability within patient conditions and outcomes, specifically focusing on improving patient representation to create a more complete view of a given individual's clinical state over time, and on providing context around the data and the risk models as it relates to developing evidence-based guidelines. Working closely with multidisciplinary teams, his work is fundamentally motivated by the notion of augmentation, not automation, where rather than utilizing computation to replicate healthcare decisions, he aims to augment the existing skill sets of those engaged in healthcare by contextualizing the wealth of available data. Broadly speaking, to determine for to determine what information, if available, would improve decisions relevant to their role. His work is funded by the Frontiers CITI and NIH Supplement for Improving AI Readiness of Data and Philanthropic Programs. So if you will welcome Dr. Keith Feldman for me, I will pull up his slides. Great, thank you, Keith. Thanks. Thanks for the invite. And I am sorry that it was a very long bio I should have edited. So the first lesson for your job talk is to ask what the expectations are because that was a bad job. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy. I'm excited to be here about this. I think this is a really interesting and important part of your talk that you're gonna get an overwhelming amount of information about as you go through your job process and search. And I feel like, it's going to feel like there's no right answer. And I'm not going to make that better today because there is no right answer to that. But I do think that there are some general principles that you can think about from a practical standpoint that makes the job talk a logistical setup that you can sit down and break down this empty space that they're going to give you for 45 to 50 minutes to talk about yourself. And I think a lot of times when I talk to people about this and postdocs and other people that are going through the process, most people don't conceptually think about like what the job talk is. And I think the first thing that you would think about is it's actually three talks in one, which is what makes it so difficult, right? So everyone here for the most part has given some form of scholarly talk. You've given a research talk and you feel comfortable presenting your research. But that's only realistically a small part of what the job talk is. You're also presenting yourself and your career trajectory, and you're also presenting you as a person. So differently than other places like conferences, you talk to people at breaks and you have lots of other experiences, you're gonna have a ton of other interviews. And that's fine, but I feel like the job talk specifically gives you a chance to show how you fit in the broader picture of where you are. And I think that's a piece that most people glaze over. And I was saying that I spent a lot of time on perhaps to my own fault, like when I did my own. So I think I wanna start with just generally outlining what today is gonna to be conceptually. I think every job talk's different and we'll talk about that. So I think, the practical pieces I wanna to touch on are the organization and the content of the talk as a category, some logistical aspects, and then I wanna end with some PowerPoint tips, which I think there's a lot of good resources online. I don't wanna belabor that, but I do think there's some things that people can conceptually think about. Two quick disclaimers, every job talk is gonna be different and everyone is gonna have their own personal feedback. So the most important thing I think that you should take away from anything that I say today is just that find how you fit into this framework. It's just a bunch of pieces, lots of building blocks. What you make the blocks up are totally up to you. I just want to give people a conceptual idea of how we and a few other people have structured talks. And the most important person in your job talk is your advisor. And if it's not your advisor because you don't see them, it's your mentor. And if it's not your mentor, it's the new assistant professor in your department. It is your discipline. I will preface, I'm a computer scientist by training. My background is in machine learning. Everyone is different. I, my job talk and my friend in high performance computing was very different. Everyone's talk is different. Somebody will tell you the content to put into your talk. I think the most important thing to remember is that you have a set amount of time and you have a lot to talk about. So with that, I kind of just want to start with the organization. Conceptually, I think the job talk, well, there's been a lot of organizations over the years. The hourglass method was here when I was doing my job talk and now I felt incredibly old making this. But now plus one or plus computational biology has this fancy new 
plot. But I think conceptually, they're very similar. That the idea is that there's several parts of the talk. Most people are aware that there's like narrow projects, big themes, and we'll touch on this later. But I think as you start to outline your talk, just remember that there are good resources about just general organization. The talk itself, I feel personally, has three large components in it. So there's a background part, so the who, the why, and the where. There's a research component, the bulk of it being the what. And there's also a future part where I feel like a lot of candidates kind of glaze over, but you could spend as much time, you have the hour. So if you feel like there's value in presenting what you are, where you're going, I think there's a lot that you could talk about in this section. So I wanna just briefly touch on kind of these. So I think the background section is actually fairly difficult because you don't have a lot of time. So you're talking about yourself, so who you are and things that are relevant, not covered in your bio. You're talking about where, so how you got here from all the things that you've been to. Did you do a master somewhere else? Did you do undergraduate research? Did you have experiences in high school that made you want to do research? So how did you end up there? And then why? So why are you doing this research and kind of what motivates the background of your next bulk of your talk, which is your research. So most people want to provide a background motivating section. And meshing that with your personal background is actually not trivial. So think about how you fit into that. And these don't have to be like 33%. There's no math here. I spent an enormous amount of time on the why, and I spent very little on the who. I know my CV is being sent around everywhere. I could do a little bit about me, and I can spend places otherwise. So I chose more about the why. A lot of my work coming from an engineering department in a health so I work in a hospital now, but all of my research was in healthcare. I spent a lot of time talking about that just position and how I ended up there. So I think just conceptually, when you think about the background, I, the biggest thing that I could touch on is just two points. Do not copy your CV. Everybody in that room has your CV. And if they don't have it, they will get it. So anything that you feel like is just a replicate of your CV or the spy or a linear path of things that you have or a list, you can skip. Because again, time is your most important attribute here, asset here. So I think a lot of people spend it about like where you're going and where you learn techniques. And I've seen the roadmap slide plenty of times and plenty of job talks uh, for candidates that we've looked at. And I think it is really valuable. But what I think elevates it beyond just I went here and then I did college here is talking about like, what did you, why? Like, what did you get from these places, right? You can, you can add as much or as little detail as you can. So yes, you can put a slide up and say, I went to college in Indiana. I did work in her name and then I came here. That's great. I could also pull up your CV and get that. But you can say like, oh, I spent an enormous amount of time training on some fancy lab technique because, or I worked at IBM's large mainframe computer, like something about what you learned in these areas. Because again, they have your CV. If you can use this to prompt questions and get ahead of things, that might be helpful. In the background section of thinking about motivation, predominantly everybody talks about addressing the gap, right? You're finding what gap you're gonna find. Everyone's really good at this. We've done lit searches. You're here because you've been a competent researcher. So we spend an enormous amount of time doing things that we're comfortable with. We're comfortable saying, oh, this was the gap in literature and we found it. And we're doing all this exciting stuff to find it. But I also think that this is a hidden opportunity to really start to seed about you, right? You can start to seed like a central theme of your research. Your area is much bigger. If I Google computational health, there are a billion things out there. And yes, I have many slides to talk about like the areas that I filled when we were in grad school and then postdoc. But I think the more important thing here is that you only have probably 40 minutes left from here. So if I can start to seed your mind to think about the things that I'm going to be talking about for the next 40 minutes and scope you down, I think it's really helpful because there's immediately at this point, People in your discipline are tuning out because they know all this. People that are not in your discipline don't care. They care about you. So I think if you can start to seed in the things that you're about to talk about and provide, you don't not explicitly, unless you want to, but just the concepts. Why is this important? Why did you address it this way, this technique? Just words at this point. And I think just the last part is that your background is, again, really not the focus of this talk. So you have to balance this out with about, like you could talk about yourself forever and you only have 40 minutes at this point for, with questions. So time, again, is your most valuable asset. So try and find a way to balance that. So you wrap up your background and really the bulk of your talk is your research, right? You're, talk, you're here to talk about you. It's a job talk and that's great, but we do not want a scientific talk, right? This is a much bigger piece. So how do you blend research into like a larger theme about a job? I think there's a couple of things. This is an opportunity to talk about connections between your work. So most talks that I've seen present somewhere between two and three projects. 
that's totally a heuristic and arbitrary. Some people can do a phenomenal job talking about one if it's very large. Some people talk about more, though it tends to be a little bit fast. So how do you start to scope that? More importantly, how do you align what you're about to talk about to the department? And we'll talk about this again later in the talk for logistics and stuff, but you heard another, the previous talk hit on this and they did a great job talking about how do you align with where you're going through your teaching statement? This is your opportunity to align your works with where you're about to be. If this in campus has a very famous computational lab in microbiology, it may be beneficial if you've done work in microbiology to mention that, or at least to talk about how you fit into the broader picture, or you maybe want to avoid it because the space is very full. Again, it's strategy and how you want to decide. The more important thing that I'd like to get across here is that this is not a dissertation defense. The worst job talks that I've seen, well, not the worst, the ones that I found the most difficulty connecting to are ones that I felt like were just a dissertation talk. They could be exceptionally well given. People can be very charismatic. But if I'm just looking at you present the last eight years of your life, it is very difficult for me to think about in 50 minutes, you as a person and what you're going to do and how you fit into what we're doing here and what we're doing next. It's a, not a dissertation. And you're going to have to be selective about what you do. I think the best phrase that I found while I was looking at this talk is actually from that plus article, this idea of logical over chronological. And I really like this. And this is something that I'm going to steal for other trainees. This idea that I like to see where you're logically going. But I do not need a step-by-step -step of where you've been to get there. I do not care potentially that you had a bunch of failed experiments, unless you can tie that into a resiliency or about you or about bringing in new collaborators, but that's strategy. We could talk about that later, but I think every step and every project doesn't need to be here. You do have to give the big picture because what is going to happen is that you have spent the last seven years or so of your life in this field. You know, every nook and cranny of it. You're about to talk to people who have probably not even had coffee yet in the morning, and they don't know. So if you can give me a big picture about what you're going to present, that's very, very helpful to help me focus down. I like this, stra this structure, and this is a personal preference, but I do think that uh, several of the articles tend to... Uh, so there's some good work out of UChicago, which I do have links for. The Plus article mentions things like this. You can find a lot of good resources about structure. The idea is that you're presenting to academics. So making your work accessible at a high level is important. How do you, why are you doing this? Why is this important to society and to people? How is this going to fit into the larger scheme of the world? That's where a lot of the level of detail that you're going to need is, right? This is really important. We spent a lot of time motivating it. We worked with great collaborators across different institutions. We've done all this work. Cool. So that's where a lot of your background and your motivation lives. You start to move into the projects. You're going to lose a few people and that's okay. So people in your discipline will start to pick up. So I'm really comfortable not, I'm not as comfortable in genomics. So I'm going to focus really more on computational phenotypes. The people that do that will perk up a little bit and they'll say, okay, like, do you know your field? This is a kind of a chance for you to talk about what you know, and what you don't know, kind of where the field is, but it's still kind of conceptual, right? Computational phenotypes have been limited, blah, blah, blah. We can kind of do this. But I do think that what people tend to overlook is this balance between the second and this third. So lots of people talk about their field. Very, and then lots of people want to put lots of details. So very technical slides, very dense material. And that's not bad. I've heard time and time again, people tell you not to put that into a job talk. I disagree with that. And this is several people, there's some literature that supports this or some literature that's against it. I think like anything. I think that it's important to put a little bit of detail into your slides because you are the expert. They are bringing you in for a reason. To show that you have some expertise in the area is okay. A lot of material, a lot of these large like studies that have been done about job talks and just consensus papers talk about providing a short amount of very detailed to placate other experts in the room is really important because you are going to be a colleague. So just being high level and talking is not going to get it's not gonna advance the science. So I do think that providing some detail to express that like what you're doing and to show that you recognize that it is very complicated. I know I only have 50 minutes. This is very difficult and we're not gonna go through every step here, but it is important to realize that we did adjust for this thing. We did realize that we had to collect this other type of data. We did something to show that I am an expert in this and this is the way that I would like you to think about it. But then to quickly move back up, right? So because we did all this data, we know that there's other implications of that. and then. With society, we realize that this is a challenging problem to scale. And you can move it back to bring your audience in. Just think about who you're connecting with. The biggest flaw I see here sometimes is that like, yes, you've been told and you are an expert at this point. You are an expert in an area, but you are not the only expert in the room. And time and time again, I see job talks in which people who are experts 
talk about this as like they have reinvented the wheel. You are the only person. If I can provide any piece of advice today, it is please do not alienate the people in the room. Your job is not to prove that you are smarter than everybody there. The whole point of this is to connect with these individuals with the type of research that you do and the type of area that you work in and the type of field that you'll be in if they hire you here. So just realize that when you're talking about all these things, this is really an opportunity to show that you understand your field and the significance of the work that you do and to highlight your experience in a meaningful way that people who are consuming this understand why and what you did and why you're doing it. Do not prove to me that you built the best model in the world because this happened, because I guarantee you that your question and answer session will be much more pleasant if you do not do that, because people get very testy, so especially in the morning. Please do not put lots of jargon in. My field is the bane of existence for this. So everyone knows that these words exist. Try and just keep it at a reasonable level. I understand that some of this is gonna slip through. Do not provide works that are just anecdotally not related. You may have done lots of really great work, but if I cannot see a link between these, it's very difficult to see as a colleague in the future that you're gonna be doing an area to advance like our department or our discipline. It helps if there's like a central theme to show that you had some level. And again, I don't know this. You can lie to me, make a theme, think about it before you get here. You do not need to have a perfect answer to this before you start your talk. And I think I just wanna to touch a little bit on the future and kind of the end of the talk, which tends to get glazed over. So the recommendation from a lot of these papers is to embody the future. I don't really know what this means. I spent a lot of time Googling around to think about what they were trying to get at. And I think it's important. And I do think that this is an important topic. I don't mean to play light of this. You are being hired as the next generation of scientists into a department. So what is that going to mean? You are going to bring something new, new ideas, new techniques, new collaborations, just new. So what is it that you are going to bring into the department? And you can keep this at a pretty high level. This is the area that I really think that we can advance. And this is almost where everybody stops. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to cure cancer. Great. So, and even my own talk, I went back and looked at, I did a terrible job at this. Like I was like, oh, I really think that augmentation and automation is a good structure here. I want to improve the way that we conceptualize medical decisions instead of replicating them. Cool. I did not provide in my talk tangible five-year goals. Part of it, it could be that some places require this for your packet, some places don't, and that's okay. But tangible goals are actually really helpful here because everybody knows the big picture. For the most part, people in your discipline know the big picture. And as long as you can talk about how you advance it, I think that's fine. Here is your chance to say, in the next five years, like, I'm going to be much better at about improving social determinants data into this area. I think that it's a clear lack, and I think we're going to do it in the next five years. I like high level things like this because I find that it helps me to let me talk to the room. It depends on how many nods I'm getting, how many people are asleep. That's great. I have also seen very successfully structure. And I think that's also very, that's okay. And it's a personal preference. I find this to be a little overwhelming personally, and I've seen it done exceptionally well that I just don't think that I could convey this in a period of time. I would get bogged down in the details, but people have done it exceptionally well where they're like, in the next couple of years, like maybe don't lead with manuscripts, but they're like, these are the areas that I really think are important. I've seen people touch on the strategic plans for um, NIH different institutes. Like this has been an area of emphasis over the last five years. I really think that this is what's coming or like there's a new RFA coming out. I think that you can touch on some of that. A quick side note though, is that you just gave a whole talk about stuff. I did not talk about you. And I think that is what is almost always missing in job talks that I see. You are a person with lots of attributes and you should try and weave in what those attributes are. So maybe you're really good at collaborating across disciplines. You're a good bridge between human, uh, genomics and the clinic. You're a really good bridge at bringing in uh, engineers and clinicians. Like, I mean, that's something that you feel like you're strong at, great. I think that you could talk about new methods, right? I'm really good at finding what the current literature is and kind of where people go. Cool, I think that's probably not a strong suit for a job talk, but I've seen people talk about it. I think it's reasonable. You're really interested in how you apply data or apply methods across fields. That's been a great one in the past. Yes, I realize that engineers have been doing this in car manufacturing for 15 years, but we haven't applied it to healthcare and I don't need to build the newest, fanciest method. I've been really good at moving this across. I think that you can talk about you and whatever you think your strengths are, you can highlight that throughout. You don't have to put a whole slide together for it. And I guess lots of people feel like they just talk about, if it's on the slide, they have to talk about it. You can use your words 
you can talk about things that you want to introduce conceptually for people to think about without having it be a whole slide. The biggest lack of any of this is that you are about to move, and I guess there's a power dynamic and people feel very weird about this, and I did too. So I don't want to make light of this, but you are about to move into a role in which you are now a colleague with the people in the room. So talk to them like that. This is how I see this type of work fitting. Now, it can be very difficult because you don't want to call, I don't particularly like calling out people. People move, institutions move, things change. So it doesn't have to be that I'm going to collaborate with you to do this very specific thing. But, oh, your institution has a phenomenal genomics program. I really think that some of the work that I'm bringing could benefit by having additional metabolomics data, which we haven't had in the past, and I really think could move it forward. You could really talk about how your program fits in with the larger department. And I think most people feel confident going on websites. Everybody hears this. So, right, look at the department, find the mission, the values, cool. I think that people are comfortable doing this by now. But it doesn't mean that department one and department three just get different things, right? You don't just highlight that they have different strengths. They could just be fundamentally different departments, right? So you just heard that some people have undergraduates, high school students, talk about that. Talk about how your work fits in. We, uh, we have always had REU students in the past. I realize that your institution doesn't have this, but like it has a great high school program. You can mention, I wouldn't put a slide for this in a job talk, but you can mention that like our work has been supported by a number of undergraduates, right? So an easy way to like slide things like this in kind of subtly is talk about who was on a project. Nobody believes, and no matter how many times they tell you this, nobody believes that the project that you presented is 100% yours at this point. Some of it, 95% of it could be yours, but maybe you had undergraduate students in your lab and you worked with them. Just talk about them or have a slide up there and talk about them. It's easy, like this was our team because somebody will be like, oh, that's great. Like you had a large team of undergraduates. Like some, it's a conceptual idea. You're just planting seeds here for your interviews later. And then don't be afraid to, creep on people. I, I think that this is fine. Like everyone knows that you're going to go to your website. I, everyone expects that you're going to like look at the people that you're going to interview with. You could also just do it in general for the department. I think this is totally reasonable. Um, organizationally, just in the interest of time, I, we'll get a lot of these slides. I'm happy to take questions during or after, but I think just content wise, a lot of that is going to come from your advisors. The bulk of the time that I want to spend for yeah the next 20 minutes or so is just logistics kind of about the talk itself. So this, I'm going to preface this section. This is also a disclaimer. This is about knowing yourself and how you like to present and how you feel comfortable. You need to feel comfortable in your job talk because I, there are so many times I've seen people go up, grip this podium and just talk like they are a machine going through it. Please do whatever makes you feel comfortable because a comfortable talk is going to sound better and people are going to connect with it much more than the the next section is predicated on understanding how you feel in a most comfortable way. Even if you follow all the best tips and tricks and you don't have full sentences and you have like a little script, I think that's all okay. Just do what you feel comfortable with. But that aside, do not go over time. The number one thing is that you do not want to go over time. People will leave, people will be mad. They'll feel like that you've wasted time. Also, many teaching schools, they don't like this because it feels like you can't adhere to the time that you're going to have with your students. So I think that it also, it's more than just like respect for the people. It's also like, could you, we gave you an hour and you're talking for two hours. This is ridiculous. You're never going to succeed here. So just do not go over time. Everything is about balancing time. The most important asset you have here is time because you're going to have 30 interviews to talk about work with other people who are going to vote for you later. This is 50 minutes of time. So what does that mean? You're going to hear like, right, budget for question and answer, and that's great. You have to budget for other things, too, that I did not do my first job talk. So your intro could be very long. People can be very long-winded. They can talk about other things. They can, like, connect with their friends that are in the front row. The department chair may have, like, just seen somebody new. Your intro is not short sometimes, and it's very uncomfortable because you're staying there, like, counting down the seconds that you're going to have left, and people are just talking. So budget some time for the intro. And then budget some time for interruptions. Yes, questions, you can, we can talk about that later. But there's also like, the doors could be locked and you have to like open them. We had to stop once because we had a seminar get out in the room next to us and they wanted me to wait for the seminar to leave so that it wasn't loud. Something will come up, just budget some time, just be conservative with your time. Know when your talk is during the day. So every talk, well, most places will give you your schedule ahead of time. Look at when your talk is. If it is the first thing on the first day, you won't know anybody there yet except what you found online. So you can be a little bit more general. If your talk is the last talk of the second day of interviews, 
you can spend a little bit of time like adding things, not too detailed, but like you can change your verbiage a little bit. Like, oh, I had a really great conversation with our neonatology department. Like I was very excited by some of the work they're doing. It fits in a lot with what I'm about to show you. Like you can add some personal touches in to draw people back in. Again, nobody likes to be talked at for 50 minutes straight. So finding ways to do this. Um, yes, there's also things about like knowing like when there's lunch and stuff, but I think more importantly, it's knowing like logistically who you have talked to beforehand. Decide when you want questions. Um, some people hate them in the middle. I don't care. Some people tend to like them at the any time. Some people will tell them that you want them at the end and people will ask them in the middle anyway. So how do you want to handle when people ignore what you ask for? Just be aware that questions are really kind of a integral part of this because you're talking about yourself and the things. If you don't feel comfortable off the cuff answering every question, nobody knows how many slides are in your talk unless anybody just saw that. You can put lots of slides at the end. If you feel uncomfortable answering detailed questions about math on your slides, or you feel like someone's gonna be really upset, make a slide for it, hide it at the end. If somebody has a question for it, go to it. If they don't have a question for it, nobody knows. It's not a huge deal. So I think it's fine to have some extra slides at the end of your talk. Everybody does this, I know that's fine, but I do think that people are afraid to like in job talks because you send it to the department. I promise you, I have never once looked at a PDF of a job talk and been like, wow, there's a bunch of extra slides here. Like they must be really uncomfortable. So it's not a huge deal. You have to be your own moderator sometimes. I know that there'll always be a moderator in the room, but sometimes somebody will dominate questions, particularly at undergraduate focused universities in which you may be collaborate or there's an area that you may be overlapping with somebody who has a genuine interest, not in a malicious way about what you're doing. And if they have questions about this type of work and generally things, well, I guess maybe not undergraduate, but more teaching focused universities, they may have questions about some of this stuff. You have to cut them off. You just have to. You can follow them up offline. You can do things, get more questions, get your ideas out there. One person can easily take up the whole Q&A session. Organize your talk in a meaningful way. So you're about to brain dump seven years of your life onto somebody at, who has really kind of just going to be there. They're just there because they're supposed to be there, oftentimes. I've seen lots of different organizations. The outline is fine. It is not my favorite, but it is a totally respectable and structured way to do it. I like using images. So that's an example of the one that I used in my job talk. I had three sections. And whatever you do, just have repetition. So for each section, I have my, my same image. I talk about what I'm doing. You can bold the introduction. You can bold the paragraph. Whatever you want to do, I think is totally fine. Just make sure people know where they are because it gives them something to ground themselves on. Because when you, and then do not feel like you have to have like one of 250 slides. That's bad. Don't put the slash. You can have a slide count and we'll talk about that later, but don't put the slash because then they feel like they're dragging. You're trying to get them to the end. Just show them where they are, right? Bold this, bold background, bold research, same image every time. Keep showing the same outline and then just, just change where you are as a roadmap. Some people call it landmarking if you want to Google it around. It's kind of a useful tip for just general talks. My favorite stuff to talk about, though, is the room logistics. So this is an image that I think is funny and I use a lot, but it just it highlights so many good features. So just know where you are in the room. So first, yes, you've probably heard for years, don't face away from your audience. We can't hear you. It's bad. It's bad practice. Great. But it's also really important just to know logistically where you are. So this room has one camera. It's important to know that that camera is here instead of over there in case you wander. And we'll talk about wandering in a second. It's important to know a little bit about the types of medium. And we'll talk about that in a second. You should feel like you are comfortable in the space that they provide you. So first, how do you like to interact with environments? I am actually a pacer. I like to walk around when I talk. And it is very difficult for me to stand behind a podium and not move. But you have to be aware that sometimes that's fine and other times it's not because in some settings like this room, pacing may not be the best because of the location of the camera or the location of the people. There's some other logistics too about, right? Some rooms don't have clickers, some rooms do, but importantly, this projectors, what is the media? So screens, this is not great because you're covering it, but it's not the end of the world because you guys can still see kind of where what's behind the screen. Projectors, you cannot. So be aware with kind of what they provide and kind of what the room looks like and how you feel comfortable. If you are a pacer like me and you don't want to sit behind the podium and bounce and talk to people like move, just 
realize how you are how you like to present and kind of think about what that looks like in, in, in different types of spaces because you're going to get every type of space you can imagine you may get a tiny little room with like a step down you may get a room in which there are I did not this was not me but I've been in a seminar in, or a job talk in which there was a 500 person classroom and there was eight people in the room not good like not that like it's a bad thing but like how do you interact with that type of space with so much empty space so just be aware that your environment plays a huge part in how you interact with environment your individuals i did not have to do this but this is actually something that i think about a lot now because of other types of talks hybrid presentations are important for a couple of reasons i am a pointer this does not work anymore so maybe if you're streaming on video it's okay but I can't see specifically what I'm pointing at all the time. So just be aware of kind of what's out there. Um, a big thing is for the question and answer session, you're not gonna look at somebody. Like if you ask me a question, I can answer to you. When the ether asks me a question, I don't know where I'm looking and what I'm doing. So sometimes it can be really weird. So just be comfortable that like, it's not just that like people are online. It's that you're interacting with people that you don't have an immediate back and forth for. So again, time so the stopping and waiting and hoping that they put another chat in sometimes really difficult a lot of times i've seen just people say like they give an answer and they say like i hope that answers your question if not i'm happy to follow up after the talk keep things moving do not feel like you have to wait for them to type a new response because they're probably getting coffee so um if you haven't done this i do think that there's some utility in leveraging public speaking resources if you feel uncomfortable talking that's fine but even if you are very comfortable in front of a room there's a lot that you can learn from like the public speaking space. So volume, everyone's aware of like rate and pitch, but like how to use pauses really effectively. Some people use blank slides. I like to just have pictures that I leave up there. Some people, how do you do speed? So some things you can intentionally make less important by going faster. I think that there's a lot of like latent and like kind of just maybe nonverbal ways that you can improve your speaking if you want to spend some time doing it. And I just want to end because I want to spend time. I, this is. I think the most important part is that you can ask questions. So I do want to end just a quick set of PowerPoint tips and tricks. Please put slide numbers on because when you ask me to go to the slide with the blue plot and our theme at the hospital is blue, I cannot find the blue plot. Every plot is blue. So I can't know what you're talking about. And again, I do not want to go back and forth with you. Like, is this the blue plot? Is this the blue plot? Is this the blue plot? And then I lose time, time. So slide numbers, really easy. Just click add. It pops up on the bottom. It's great. Vector images. So I know it's really easy to open snipping tool and snip the picture on your talk. Please do not do this because when you have a presentation on a 200 inch monitor or a single screen for a giant lecture hall and it's blurry, it makes me very sad because you had an opportunity to make these slides for me. Like if I'm watching them, just use vector images. And for vector images, so people are aware, they're PDFs or EPSs. So they're ones that will recompute based on size. So they will scale um, automatically rather than like a single snipped image, like a JPEG or BMG uh, or bitmap. I'm happy to talk to you about this later, but use those. They're great because they also scale for projectors and other things. My number one pet peeve for job talks, and I've talked to other people about this here, do not apologize to me for a slide being busy. You made the slide. Do not apologize for it. If it is busy and you didn't want to remake the table, that shows laziness to me. Like you could easily have just made the table, just make fewer numbers. It's less information. The busy, like, I'm sorry, this is really busy, or I know this is really small. Well, if you know it's small, fix it. So I think that you can easily do things that like don't show that you're not willing to put the effort in. And I don't mean that you have to remake the entire world. It's not like I'm asking people, like everyone's still doing their postdoc. Everyone knows that you're busy. Just do something with a smaller part, focus it in. Don't show the whole slide if the whole slide is not important. The biggest takeaway from this, besides me being like frustrated with it, is that you have a very limited attention span for individuals. If you want me to focus on somewhere, just focus me because I don't know where I'm supposed to focus. You are the expert presenting to me your research and your career path and your life. So when you show me 300 school, like places that you've given a talk at, I'm looking like, or I've seen people like, we presented at these 12 conferences and I'm like looking at the conferences and I'm trying to like think about what conferences they are and their rankings. Like don't, unless you have a real reason to show me specific things, don't show me everything or sorry, unless you have a reason to show me everything, like look at all the different places the data can come from. I know this is overwhelming. It's meant to be overwhelming. So we are showing you that not because I need you to know where every place is. Your medium is really important. Um, 
not just so I know that I'm, I put this up in just because like the projector cart is out of like style, but even this so projectors are really different than digital screens for a number of reasons. One because of this ridiculous like overlay Two because they just take some time to boot up and they can die. And when they die, you have to wait for them to recycle. So be comfortable like filling the air. I had a projector die in a talk once I had eight minutes where I just talked. I mean, at this point, you know, your job talk, you just have to roll with it, things will happen. But because projectors are a fundamentally different medium from a computer science standpoint. So they do have a different color palette and the way that they present information is really different. Be aware that the way that you expect information to show up may not be the way that you get it. I've seen so many things online tell you what I was making for this talk. Like, see if you can get a glimpse of the room, like understand what's happening. I don't even remember what, what state you're in sometimes. You've just flown there overnight. You're giving a talk. You feel like it's a whirlwind. They're not going to show you the room. Like you don't have time. Just be aware that like things could change. Plan accordingly. Because if you know that it could wash out, just don't use that color palette. It takes two seconds to change the color palette. And also you should make it accessible. I know that people like you hear this for papers. I am a big proponent of this for talks. Like your talk should not depend on the audience being able to see red, green colors. Like it takes, we are at a point in society, like you can easily Google like accessible color palettes and just like click change color on things. It's not like technically very difficult. So I would recommend doing that. The last thing is everyone knows, please don't put transitions and animations, right? Like you've heard this for years. That's great. Like, wow, it's super cool. Look at all the stuff I did. When they don't have a professional version of PowerPoint and they make you do a PDF, this is what that looks like. So that's terrible. But there was another point is that, yes, we everyone's heard this from their advisor, like, don't do this. The other thing is that I do not want to go back and click every time to go to a different slide as I'm like answering your questions later. So every time I have to click and change the transition, like it's just a waste of click like, of time. Just use multiple slides if you have animations, just make one at a time. Quickly, I wanna just wrap up with just some things that I think are important. Practice in front of people, not your pets. See how he feel that like blank stare of like being trapped, trap your lab mates. That's what you want. You want people to feel like they know what you're doing as well as you do. They're happy. I, I think for the most part, I've never had an individual find like say no, unless they don't have time. But like, be critical. Like we always, even when I was in grad school, like we told people that like the point of the practice talk was to be like mean, right? Like, I think this was confusing. Like that's the time that you want it. You want people to pick it apart and say like, that transition was really fast. Like little things, you can decide they're not important, but just little things. Last thing is do not be afraid to update this, your talk, because, and everyone knows, right? You iterate your talk, that's great. You can iterate it very specifically and strategically because you're going to get a bunch of questions after your first one. And you can decide if those are questions that you want again. So there were some questions I got that I was happy to take again. I didn't make any changes because they were questions that I felt like I could kill. And I was like, this is great. I'm going to do this. I'm going to let this stay because if it's not like, if it wasn't something that was like, this was unclear, but like, you know, something that I felt like, but if it was something that it took me a long time to like think about, or like, I felt like they really had a good point change your talk. It's not the end of the world. No one's between institutions is emailing your talk back and forth. They're not going to know. Change your talk. It's totally fine. And then just be gracious. I've never seen a talk go faster downhill than when people argue with the audience. Again, do not prove that you were smarter than other people. Just talk about them as your peer and your colleague. Yes, like everyone knows you shouldn't be mean, but like even like subtle things, like don't tell people like, oh, we thought about that, but it was a terrible idea. Why, why do you need to do that? Just tell them like, that's a, we really thought about that. We didn't have the data or the time. It's something that we think we can explore in the future. There's really basic cordial ways to explore this. Even if you hate the idea, just don't do it. So I, I was at a job talk once and somebody asked like, if you could do this in a faster time and there, it was like a math talk. And they're like, no, absolutely not. They're like, it would be impossible. And the guy was like, I did this. This is my area of research here. Like we already did this. Like, why would you fight with somebody who could be the expert in that area? And it was not good. So I think with that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I'm happy to talk to people after or send the slides around, but feel free to 